recording. Welcome everyone. This is week four, and this is our technically the very first cohort call, which would be template for rest of the cohort calls. Really exciting to welcome you all today. Um, today I will be co-facilitating with Seyun. There are two Seyuns in the screen because Seyun has joined from uh, their phone and laptop. So uh, they will be looking at the chat. So if you have any question, please do add them in the chat. We have Etherpad today for shared notes. And as usual in our um, board calls, we will ask you to introduce yourself. We are still getting to know you, but today we are asking an icebreaker. How have your first few weeks in OLS been? Uh, share a link, pick a picture, a word, a, a GIF, anything creative you would like to share with us to show how you're feeling about your role as project lead and the team member in OLS. And this is a good opportunity for us, and especially PASS to know if you're not feeling particularly well adjusted with uh, our system, would be a good opportunity for us to reach out to you and try to address some of those issues. Awesome. Um, and I would probably rudely mute you uh, if you have accidentally left your microphone on. Um, that is not to say that you're not allowed to speak, but we would try to uh, create more spaces for you in the breakout session that we have planned for today. Okay, um, with that, another reminder, we do have a code of conduct that applies to this call. So for anything that you would like to report from uh, this cohort call, but also overall participation in OLS, uh, please write it to you to the directors, directors at we are OLS, Org. Please look at how that's spelled. There are lots of items in there. Uh, if you want to individually reach out to any of the directors, please do uh, reach out to you or me who are in the call, but we have Bernice and Emmy as well. Um, for anything cohort related, please reach out to Paz, who is our friendly guide for everything that we do in cohort. Second reminder, uh, as you see in the chat, some folks are putting S or W. So for every cohort call, we want you to choose if you want to interact in spoken format or written format. Uh, we would have breakout session where you would be assigned to respective choices. Um, so the written format allows you to talk to each other just in the writing, in the chat of Slack or um, not Slack, sorry, in the Zoom chat or in the shared notes. And if you put S, we will assign you to the spoken breakout room. I would ask you to put that letter S or W in the front of your name. If for any reason you're unable to edit your name, just uh, indicate that in the chat and one of us will edit your name and make sure that uh, we have the information. Okay, we do have our guest speaker today, three oh, guest speakers. Uh, so we have uh, Saskia and Mariana. They are gonna wave us. Read us. We have Yo Yehudi, who's not a guest, but she is a guest speaker for this particular call. You might see her hosting some of the future calls. Okay, and um, again, please do use the Etherpad as much as you can because uh, that is the place for you to write your own notes. I want to kick off this call by introducing the topic for today. And our topic for today, I apologize. There are lots of windows open. We want to talk about tooling for open collaboration, which begins with setting up a project. So of course, we asked you to join OLS with a project of your choice, and we've looked at your projects. We're very excited what you want to do. But what often ends up happening is that we can re-scope what we want to do in OLS. So as you know, we only have four months, although we do want to change the world, it takes a lot of time and we want to do it slowly. Today we are in the week four of tooling. Uh, we have uh, up to 16 weeks, uh, which means we want to plan what we want to do, what we are able to do within these four months. Sorry, I skipped it too fast. If you want to have a look, this is our timeline. Um, over the months, we, we will also cover open science practices. We would uh, also combine them with community practices. The aim of this particular call is to help you set up a clean and welcoming repository or 
the basic requirement for your project so that your project is open for others, um, especially if you are looking for people to contribute or collaborate with you. Our learning objectives are that by the end of this particular call, we would hope that you can identify specific files or documentation that you need to create in order to ensure that your project is collaborative. Explain why you need to select specific license. So for some of you, license is a familiar terminology, but for some of you, you might be um, exploring different license types today specifically and also understand how do they apply in different open projects. Uh, we would hope that at the end of the project, you would know uh, that you need to select a license and hopefully you can identify which one would that be. Um, some of the initial documents you would be writing uh, will be introduced by our speakers today. So this is for your reference. Uh, some of the topics that today our speakers will be talking about are readme page, the landing page for the project. The, the, don't worry so much about the .md. We have provided structure here, assuming if some of you are going to create a GitHub repository. But if you're not going to work on GitHub, there are also other ways to design similar file formats. We have already talked about roadmap in our previous uh, call, and we've also talked about vision, which are written into these kind of files. We would have you talking about license today, and we would also have Saskia talking about code of conduct. Beside all of these basic file, of course, over the period you would be developing either source code or you would be creating documentation, generating visualization. You would also have references for how to organize and structure your project so it's useful and reusable for you. We will be talking about it in the next weeks as well. Okay, um, a lot of the things that we are talking about today uh, would be very specific to where our speakers work, in what context. But in the previous calls, we've also invited different speakers. So if you want to get different flavors of projects, you can always go back and explore them, them in our Open Seeds video library that uh, Bernie's maintained. OK, I have actually <laughs> covered all of them in one single slide. So with that, I'm going to stop speaking. And I'm very delighted to hand it over to our speaker, Mariana. Sorry, so just I'm the first then. Yeah. Okay. I was I was the first technically on the Ah, okay. <laughs> Sorry. You're our first yeah, sure. invited speaker. Let me share my screen. Um okay. Um so hi everyone. Um uh, my name so I'm going to talk to you today about readme files and how to make your project more welcoming to others. My name is Mariana. I've been working in scientific software um, for a long time. I've also worked either as a community builder or as a mentor for like all of these projects on the right. Um, so what is a readme file? Well, if you go to the GitHub interface, you're going to uh, see if you scroll down that this, this little box here inside the uh, the black box is a readme file. How does this get generated? It's automatic. As long as you name a file as a readme, um, it will show up like this. Uh, why is it important? Well, the readme file is the first file that um, potential contributors and users will see in your project. So it tells a lot about the maturity of, of your project. Um, so um, it also set important expectations about how much support there's going to be. So that's going to attract like um, the right kind of people that want to contribute to your project. So um, maybe someone that's very, very much a beginner and uh, maybe your project is in the is still in the beginning and doesn't have documentation, doesn't have like, you know, um, a lot of infrastructure. And then maybe it's not the best project for a, a person that's very much a beginner to contribute. Um, or maybe your project is very mature and has a lot of documentation. So either way, you should make this uh, clear in your readme. So you attract the right kind of people um, to, to contribute to your project. Um, okay, so in this talk, I'm gonna go over like uh, some important sessions of a readme file and give you some good examples of uh, what a good readme file looks like. So the first session of a readme file is the title and the introduction. 
And these are going to be like all my personal um, my personal recommendations from what I saw and collected, and I think it's good. But of course, it's not it's not um, what is right uh, in any way. It could be different for you. Um, but first, uh, I'll say you have your title, the title of your project. And then you have uh, the relevant badges to your project. And I'm going to talk more about badges um, in the future. And then you have a short description of your project, two or three se um, sentences max. You don't have to explain your project in depthness here. Um, and then I recommend you have a picture or an animation of your software. And here's a good example. So this is the README for Jupyter Notebooks. And, um, you know, they have the title and then they have the relevant badges. I'm gonna talk more about them. Um, but for example, the first badge informs the user if the build system, the CI system, you're probably gonna see more about this in the future, but the CI system is like what tests your software and guarantees that's working. Um, so this one says that's passing. That's a good sign. It probably means that the project is up to date. So, um, you know, that sig um, signal to contributors that okay, you can use this project because it's being like actively maintained. Um, it also has a badge that's very important, says that the docs are passing. So um, your docs are up to date and po possibly. And here are two other links to run the software in the web. Um, okay, another important part is the installation. So you wanna list uh, the requirements to install your software. And these are like, this is the installation for the user part. So the user is gonna like uh, look at your project, see, okay, oh, this works nice. This is kind of, it looks like what I need. Uh, how do I install it on my computer? So you need to, that's what I recommend you do the next session. And then um, an important thing is to list all the different installations for the different OSs. Um, and if you don't support an OS, you can make it clear here. Um, if the instructions are too complicated or too large, then move it to the docs page and put a little link in there. So here's another good example. So this is a C++ project. And then uh, C++, you have to build it differently in, ver in various OSs. So in this readme, the person uh, specified, okay, the Linux, Mac, you do this, in Windows, you do that. So that's good, that's important. Um, the next step that I think it's important is to how to run the software. So sometimes um, it's really, it might be really obvious to us, the developers, um, how to run our own software or how to import, and import it and how to like, uh, you know, make it work. But for people who are coming in, um, I think it's always good to have it explicit, like a little example on how to do it. Um, uh, even if you, if you think it's very obvious and, uh, or of course, if it's very like convoluted and weird, then of course you should also add this into your readme. So here's another good example. Uh, it's this Python library for the web, which is weird because Python is usually not for the web. And then here you have to include this library in your HTML header. So it's good that they already talk about this in the beginning because I feel like a lot of people would um, find this weird. Um, another, and then a following session to that is the developer installation. So if the person is in your GitHub, um, it might be because they're already like, oh, okay, this is the software that I wanna use. I wanna contribute to it, um, or I wanna modify it somehow. And, and then that's what the, the, the developer session is for. Um, and my recommendation is that you assume that your users uh, only know how to deal with the standard library of the software that you wrote. Um, but even then, uh, I think it's good to like walk them through, even through this, the standard library. And again, if it's too extensive, uh, you might want to move this information for the, uh, to the contributing MD file. And I'm gonna talk about this file later on or to the docs. Um, so here's a good example. So in this example, um, this readme teaches you how to create an environment because you're, gonna, you're probably gonna need an environment. This is the Python. Python and JavaScript um, software. So it teaches you how to create an environment, how to clone the repository, which I think it's important to not assume that people are familiar with Git. And then it teaches you like how to install the packages and even gives you like specific versions of packages because sometimes um, you have to freeze the version and have the specific versions. So yeah, so this is a good example and then tells you like different ways 
that you can run it on like um, on systems that are older than the actual system. So it's all of the little things I think it's good to have laid out in the readme if it's not too long. Um, and then there are other sessions to the readme uh, like licensing. I'm not gonna talk too much about it because you see it today, but um, you can briefly state what your license is about and then paste a link to the, to the license, um, to the full content of the license in your readme. So this is a good example, just saying, oh, this is the license. Here's the full file if you wanna you know, learn more about it. Um, another important thing is the code of conduct. So you're also gonna see more about it. So I'm not gonna talk a lot about it, um, but uh, the code of conduct is basically norms and unspoken rules that govern your community, but are not like, but are usually like overt to users. So everyone in the project kind of knows, everyone that's working there knows how to act, but not someone that's new. So it's important to have this like um, clear and if you can fit a small version or if it's small in your readme, it's better to, to put it there. But if not, it can also be moved to the contributing MD file. Okay, so what's this contributing MD file? Um, as I said, if, if any of the sessions in your readme is too large, just move it there. And um, this file is meant for you to add um, all the details from your project, um, like how to build documentation, for example, or how to build tests. These are like all, are all the details that are uh, related to how to contribute to your project. And usually they're just too large to fit on a readme file. Um, Similarly to the code of conduct, uh, you should also try to um, uh, add to this file, what are the overt rules um, that, are, uh, that are ruling your project, but are not, um, you don't talk about them. So how to send a PR, uh, does a PR has to uh, be linked to a, a, an issue uh, every time you submit to a, a PR, um, how to open an issue, uh, how to ask questions inside of your community. All these things are very important and we never talk about them. And then um, sometimes people come to our communities and they're doing it wrong, but we also never explain to them how to do that. So contributing file is a good place to do that. Uh, it's also cool to have it explicit on uh, which license the code that your contributor will contribute to your project will be in. Maybe it's, it's something different. And another cool session of the contributing is uh, explain what are the expectations and benefits to become, becoming a maintainer to the project. Um, maybe your project, you know, will invite people to go to a conference or like, oh, this is what we expect from you. You should come into our weekly meetings. Um, so that's cool to have it uh, laid out on this file. So this is a good example of what a contributing um, file might look like. This one is very large. So um, the people made uh, an, index, an index with all like these little um, things that you should um, have. And um, yeah, another sessions you can add to your readme file are trademarks, acknowledgements, if you're, if other people like either, you know, paid or contributed to the file, to the, the project and you wanna like highlight them. Um, also security, like how to contact you for a security issue. You don't want people to open a GitHub issue that's public to everyone and tells everyone what are your security problems. You want them to contact you like personally, like so you should drop an email there or like some other form for them to contact you. Um, if they're interested in doing a donation, you can also add that in your readme file. If they're interested in translation your project, you can also like add instructions on how to do that. And the docs, there must be a link to the docs to your in your um in your project somewhere, if you have docs. And uh, I personally recommend you to put it right underneath like the description, not necessarily on your readme file, but of course you can also uh, add it to your read readme file. And I'm a bit over time, but this is an example, not such a great example of, um, of a readme. I really love this project, but I think uh, there's very little explanation on what's going on. And then the person doesn't explain you how to install the package, but they tell you, uh, how to import it. It's a basic usage, which is a good thing. But then uh, the API just like the documentation just comes right underneath it. I think it's um, not such a great example. And I'm gonna share uh, this document with you. These 
uh, if you are interested in adding those little badges that I talked about in the beginning, um, then you can just copy these over. And then each time there's a link, there's an, it's because I thought it wasn't clear what these were about. So you can click and learn more about them and maybe add them to your project. Um, and I think that's it. Time for questions now. Thank you so much, Mariana. Um, yeah, folks, what questions do we have? I definitely saw a couple of comments that I'm going to read. Um, if I don't write, ah, that's a question actually. If I don't write software, can I still use this advice? And what should I keep in mind? What would I change compared to some recommendation you made around coding? Uh, I don't understand the question. What do you mean if, if I don't write software? Um, yeah, so uh, Mariana, a lot of our project leads are not coders. They create mm -hmm. projects which are non-coding projects. So for example, oh, I lead, I led a project on thinking about open science governance, which had zero coding, but I still use GitHub. So I would imagine that that's the question. Around. Okay, yeah. So, I mean, if, okay, I understand now. Um, so I think if you're putting up, uh, I think there are several reasons why you put up a, you know, something on GitHub, not necessarily for code, for sure, yeah. Um, but if you're looking for a collaboration, yeah, you can definitely do a README file and grab the tips that I gave uh, and add for collaboration. Um, if you're doing it for like, just, you know, doing open science and leaving it open to people, but you still don't want, like, you just want to have it open, but you don't want to have collaboration, that's also fair. Uh, so yeah, for sure, you can pick and choose, you don't have to have everything. Mariana, So what, how should one do the readme if this is like a kind of not public facing project per se, you know, like where you have a small internal team doing things mm -hmm. and you have outside people for who basically do skills. Okay. Sorry, you cut for me a little bit, um, but I, I think the oh, question I'm, was... I'm, I'm sorry. So, yeah, so, so the question is, if we use GitHub to basically expose some content to the world, but we don't want to invite the world to, like, do things for us, you know, like, mm -hmm. then, then kind of, like, we don't want to give, we don't need to give them instructions on how to use. It's more like we need to make it clear that it's not something that the general public should be doing anything about. Or then you'd have like a readme internally facing there. Okay, so so GitHub has a, a few. Uh, so GitHub has a few different um, ways of dealing with this. You could make a uh, you could make a project private and then just make it available for the people that you're interested in that see that. But if you want to just leave it public and don't want people to interact with it, that's also fair. And you can uh, block the creation of issues by the users. Uh, so that's something you could do. And then not necessarily you need all of these uh, steps on maybe how to um, uh, build the software locally. Maybe you just want it to, to people to use it. So you just have to have the installation steps and stuff like that and like a license. I don't know. Thank you, Mariana. We have another question, actually, a couple of folks are asking. Um, again, a lot of our uh, Wireless cohort members are not coders and have likely not used GitHub. We will be covering GitHub, actually, as one of the things next week. So if folks are not using GitHub, where can they start? And it's possible, of course, to later move to GitHub. Mm. Well, I think it depends a lot on your project, um, right? There's a few different like uh, open science platforms. So if you're working with data only, then they're like platforms that are like very, um, for example, you can't update like large data to GitHub, right? So you'll never use GitHub in, in reality if you're, if you're doing uh, big data. And in those platforms, they also have readme files that are actually called readme files. Like it's a very, uh, like it's used overall, uh, I feel like in the open science uh, ecosystem. But if you think your project uh, fits 
the fits GitHub. Um, I feel like GitHub is not necessarily a code only platform. It's a platform for um, collaboration. Um, and yeah, with different people. So you, you, if you think your, your project could benefit from having like a history of collaboration uh, and yeah, like, a, you know, you need to showcase things to other users, then you could still use GitHub. Yeah. Thank you for that, Mariana. Folks, if you haven't previously done it with us, we generally say a virtual round of applause. You can, you can actually do a physical clap or <laughs> scream like you, or give us some loving emoji uh, if your videos are off or write some nice things for Mariana on the chat or Etherpad. Mariana, we really appreciate you coming and sharing your experience with us. And uh, if you had no noticed in the Etherpad, we had thought about a breakout discussion before this talk, but we had some um, technical difficulty, but now Seon is all set to lead you all into a breakout discussion. So if you are joining us for the first time, please spend some minutes before talking to each other, introducing yourself to each other, and also hopefully the insights that we have from this talk, you can carry on. So Seyun, are you ready to introduce our attendees about the breakout today? Um, <clears throat> hello, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. we hear you. Yeah. So um, um, thank you very much, Sharon. Thank you, Mariana, for the section. Thank you to you. So um, our new OLS team, we will be going into the um, the breakout section, and this is going to this is going to be going. We're going to be having a case, um, a case to talk about. Um, but but before then, you should know that for those of you who are in the S, um, those of you who indicate with S, we're going to be going to um, the same group whereby you're going to be able to interact with each other via spoken words. Why those of you be with the W, we're going into the same room, into the same breakout room where you're going to be able to talk, to talk about, um, to chat with each other about this. So this is going to be the very first case. Think of a time you're collaborating or you're working on a project, on an open project, and it was a complete train work. So the very first question you're gonna be asking or you're gonna be discussing with yourself is what happened and what actually make it chaotic. So you just have five minutes to do that. So you're, um, you are going to be talking about what happened and um, we'll actually make it chaotic. Um, Sharon, can you please start kicking people into the breakout? breakout room section? We can. Um, so we have, just to be clear, Seon, would you like us to assign two back-to-back -back breakout room for two different cases, or are you happy for folks to discuss case one and case two within the same breakout room? In that case, you can also introduce the second case. Okay, okay, okay. Um, I would like that each each group discuss these questions in each of these breakout rooms so that we got we can give people um opportunity to talk about what actually make their first open project actually um chaotic so we're going to be um si since we just have about 10 minutes we're just going to have to break the time into um into a few time then by by time by the time we are back we'll be able to harvest information in order to make um the the section quite spicy so let's let's make it one at a time all right like that all right folks i'm gonna send you into the breakout room we have two cases but uh, spend as much time in the first case if you are happy to move on to the second case which is about also remembering a good collaboration we'll send you a mid mid note reminder um to make sure that you all know at what time break you are in you have 10 minutes there you go Good discussion, everyone. Yeah. Good discussion, everyone. Good, nice time to talk. So I, I, I kind of believe that during the uh, breakout section, each one of you must have gotten to talk about your projects or a particular open source project that you guys are engaged in, open source, open science. But 
but but my one thing or the other, just like what we discuss, <laughs> the disasters of the time zones and and of a thing like that. Um, they could um, they were there were specific roadblocks or bottlenecks which didn't um, which didn't make the project go to uh, um, into fruition like of a thing. So. Um, how many hands do we take? So do you want to kind of share this kind of projects, um, this kind of um, specific issues that you had that actually make these, um, that actually make your open projects collapsed or become a train work, then um, how do you kind of see to kind of um, resolve these issues? So do we have somebody who want to, who want to share their experiences with us? Yeah, any insight from the breakout room? Anyone brave, feeling brave today? Well, I can Can I go on? Please move ahead, move ahead. All right. My name is Olufemi from Nigeria, University of Potakot. <clears throat> um, well, I shared I shared an experience with my in the breakout session just now. We were to host a conference. I was the chair of that conference sometime in 2017. And then um, I had a secretary, um, and then I had an assistant secretary. It was a national conference. And a few weeks to the conference, the secretary disappeared. And you know the, how, how useful a secretary <laughs> is to every association. It was nowhere to be found. And I was, I was, I was so confused. So, um, but luckily I was able to get, my assistant secretary was handy, a female. She was handy and we were able to you know, break through. Now, when the session, when the main conference started, we had different um, plenary sessions. Uh, there was also a chairman, for the technical sessions, who was supposed to move from hall to hall and collate, you know, different um, information from the various halls, for which we were going to use in um, identifying the best papers, you know, in different sessions. I didn't see him. I just, just through hindsight, I decided to move from room to room, and I asked if anybody came around. They said nobody came around, so I had to quickly find a way out, and uh, we got some other person to do the assignment. And at the end of the day we were able to deliver a report to the national body after the conference. So I, I shared that experience in our session. Yeah, um, thank you very much, Mr. Olufemi. Um, funny enough, we bear the same surname, uh, so it's good to meet you on this, on this program. So um, um, we won't be able to take any more and um, we'll be handing over to Dr. Yu. Dr. Yaya there, so she'll be talking to us around open licensing as a major tool for open collaboration and open science. Dr. Yu, please, you have the floor. Amazing, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen. And mm, no, I have to do presenting mode before I share it or it'll go weird. Right, I can do this. I've only been doing this for a few years. Righty, righty. <laughs> um, Okay, right. Can you see what I hope you see? Yes. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. So I'm going to talk a bit about licenses. First thing I'm going to say is I am not a lawyer. I've been working on open work for quite a few years now, and I know the basics, but international law and copyright law is complicated. So if you're ever in anything very, um, or you have big questions, um, we can answer what we can, but don't take my advice as the final thing if it's really complicated. Beyond that, let's start talking. So we'll start with some common misconceptions to give you an idea about why open licensing or licensing at all is important. The first thing is, if you put something on the internet, no one's allowed to reuse it unless you explicitly grant them permission. So that means if you see a nice picture and you download it, um, you can't, you know, sell that picture and expect that you won't get in trouble uh, by it from the owner of the picture. It's a, a, it's not respectful, but B, you don't automatically have the right just because you found it on the internet. Um, and the thing is that goes the other way as well. So if you put something openly on the web and you think I want everyone to use this, even if your intent is that, if you haven't made it clear that they can legally reuse it, then they can't reuse it. 
Um, so that's why we're talking about open licenses today, because we're giving you a way um, to say to the world, hey, folks, I made this thing and I want you to use it. And this is a way that makes it safe and legal and effective and also gives you some control over how things are used. Um, and it doesn't give away copyright. So, for example, you, you can give something multiple licenses, you can publish it, you can sell it. Um, and there are times when maybe things um, that you use without attribution might be legal um, in scenarios where the license requires you to give attribution. But given that we are researchers, we're maybe scientists, we're maybe software engineers, we're maybe community managers, I think we can all agree that it's ethically not okay to, um, to, to share things without attribution uh, unless we've explicitly waived the right to attribution. So those are a few of those common misconceptions that we've tried to bust, but I'm going to talk a bit more about what a license is and how to use a license. So the things that open licenses do is it's a small, often really short document, um, but it has wording that enables people to use the work that you've created. So that might be a software tool that you have, or it might be a photograph, or it might be a data set. Um, or it might be music. There's, you, can, you can put a license on just about anything. Um, and people can also modify that work. It's another common aspect of an open license. So that means, let's say that I've uh, shared um, a photograph. Um, if Malvika wants to take my photograph and add devil horns, um, then she's welcome to. <laughs> Assuming that I've given her uh, given an open license. Um, and then the third thing that's common in open licenses is the right to share things. So um, she can then share onwards that photograph uh, with devil horns that she's added on. Um, I'm watching you, Malvika. <laughs> um, and so we also have a nice little quote at the bottom. This is from GitHub and it's specifically about software, but uh, much of this applies in different scenarios as well. Um, so open source software is software that can be freely used, modified, and shared by anyone. Um, most licenses, not all of them, but most of them require attribution. Um, so I mentioned that earlier, that often reusing something without attribution is not cool. Uh, so an example of a license uh, that requires uh, attribution is the Creative Commons CC BY license, which basically says, share this, do what you want, just say that Yo made this image. And so long as you do that, we're good. Uh, there is another license called CC0, um, which is fully public domain. It says do anything you want. You don't have to credit me. This is anyone's and everyone's. But most licenses tend to require some level of, um, co co not contribution, attribution. <laughs> um, so saying who did the work. It can get complicated. Um, so if you spend any time in the open world, you will learn about the concept of copyleft. So someone super smart said, hey, look, here's copyright. I want to fight against copyright. Let's call it copyleft. And the idea is that um, whilst copyright, you say everything belongs to me, Copyleft enables people to say that if you reuse my work, everyone else, everything that's derivative from this work must be shared under the same license. So if I licensed my photograph, um, the, this photograph that Malvika has modified with CC by SA, um, and that's uh, the CC by, if you recall, means that you've got to attribute me, and SA stands for share alike. Um, and so if I put that license on my photograph, um, Malvika must share that photograph with exactly the same license. And the idea is that that way, the work that I've done can never be taken private. Um, and so that's kind of one school of thought that you might see in licenses. The other school of thought that you may see is what's called non-copyleft -co or permissive. Um, and permissive licenses are a bit more flexible, but they don't enforce openness. So, for example, someone who, um, let, let's say I made a photograph and I said, I don't care what people do with it. If someone goes into a private company and they use that photograph and they don't share it onwards, cool, fine by me. I don't mind. Do what you like. 
that's a non-copyleft one. So they're kind of two different schools of thoughts. And you'll often find people who are radically on one side or the other of this argument. I, I can understand both sides. I love open. But I also recognize that maybe I'm making something that um, a business might want to use and they might not want to use anything that has copyleft. So I might intentionally make something non-copyleft instead. Um, so if you look on the left, we have the examples of the non-copyleft license um, and you, uh, sorry, non-copyleft licenses. CC BY is for most creative works um, such as images, data, uh, photographs, things like that. And then on the bottom, MIT, BSD, APL, those are names of software licenses. For complicated human reasons, there are like possibly hundreds of different software licenses out there that do almost the same thing with slightly different words. Um, I tend to use MIT license for my, for my code when I'm writing code, but many of the others will be just fine. Um, on the right, you can see a couple of examples of copyleft licenses as well. So I've already mentioned there's a CC BY SA. That again, that's the one that you'd use for most creative works or data or pictures, um, or maybe a recipe. You could publish a, publish a recipe under CC BY SA. And then the ones under that, GPL and MPL, they're both copyleft um, software licenses. Anyway, we've had enough of this texty screen. Oh, another texty screen. Sorry. <laughs> so um, another thing to, to recognize is that patent isn't the same as copyright. Um, and they may or may not, when, when you put licenses on your work, they may or may not protect uh, patent rights. If that's something that you're worrying about, speak to a lawyer. I do not know almost anything about patents, but they do exist. Um, and it's worth if it's something that you're thinking about, you definitely want to speak to someone who knows a lot about it. Um, and licensing is not the same thing. Uh, so how do I apply a license? Have I convinced you that you need one? Hopefully, yes. Um, so it's actually pretty easy. Uh, like I mentioned, in the software world, there are just hundreds of software licenses for some reason. You sort of pick the flavor of one you want. So you might say, I want a non-copyleft one. Um, you can literally copy and paste the text. Um, and if you're using GitHub, you put that text into your GitHub repository. If you're not using GitHub, don't worry. Uh, we're not forcing you to use GitHub. Use what makes sense for you, where the people that you're going to meet are. Um, then you can put it somewhere else that makes sense. Uh, or for example, if it's one of the Creative Commons licenses, they have a lovely little license chooser where you sort of say, I want everyone to attribute me and I want it to be a copyleft share alike license. And then they'll give you a little image that you can copy and paste. Um, and you just copy and paste that, stick that on your work somewhere and boom, you're done. So it's usually pretty straightforward. Um, often the most challenging thing is choosing one or enforcing it if anything weird happens later on. Um, and you should use the right one for each kind of thing that you're doing. Um, so a little disclaimer here, I do not normally have slides with my very own tweets, although I do have a fantastic ego, but what I am reusing here is a slide that someone else made that was quoting me. <laughs> um, what I was trying to say here is that uh, software licenses are written specifically for software, which is something that's runnable and modifiable. Um, and in other, many other scenarios, a software license doesn't make sense on things that aren't software. And the other way around is, a set, is the same as well. So if you want to put a Creative Commons license on software, that doesn't make sense. So basically, you need to think what kind of work you have and make sure that you're using the right kind of license. Um, and we can we, we can offer, whilst I say we're not a lawyer, we can offer the basic advice of, oh, I've got X, what kind of license do I want? That's the sort of thing anyone in the OLS Slack chat will be super happy to help you out with. Um, so here are some ways to help you figure out what license you might like. Um, if you are thinking about software, try chooseralicense.com. It'll help you figure out and choose really quickly what kind of licenses you want. Um, and there's different ways to define each kind of license, depending on what interests you the most. Do you feel like copyleft is important to you or do you prefer no copyleft? If you are doing anything that's not code, Creative Commons is probably going to be your friend. Um, and down here, we mentioned data being CC0. Um, it doesn't have to be. It's always your choice how you share data. 
But remember that if, um, if you have multiple different data sources and you glue them together, it can be really hard to tell what data comes from where. And by saying, I don't require even attribution on my data, it makes it easier for people to reuse it and remix your data um, in a way that might not be possible if they have seven different data sets mixed together and they have to attribute that row to this person and the next row to a different person. I don't know if that was super clear, but um, if you're not sure, again, we can answer questions on this. Uh, we may not have time today, but we can answer a bunch of questions in chat. Um, one thing I'll actually also mention at this point is that I am the backup speaker today. So we did have another person who was going to speak um, and she came down with a sore throat at the last moment. And we're thinking about arranging some sort of ask me anything. So if you have loads and loads of questions about the nuances of licenses, we will have a session made for you. <laughs> um, so if you are using GitHub, GitHub can make it super easy to add a software license. I'll put that with a little star and say only software licenses. It doesn't make it as easy to add the Creative Commons licenses. Um, but if you start by creating a file called license, it'll pop up and say, choose one of these. So you literally select it from a drop down. Um, and in fact, here's a little animation that shows that it pops up. Uh, I think someone's got some sound reverberating in. Um, Hopefully the animation has given you an idea of what's going on there. So I'm just going to skip on. Too long, didn't read. Yo, you've been talking for a long time. Please stop. Okay. Have a license if you want people to reuse your stuff. Don't reuse stuff if it doesn't have a license. Different licenses for different types of things. And if you want a nice permissive default, as in anyone can do anything they want, our recommendations would be for code, consider the MIT license for images, writing, documents, recipes, whatever it might be, maybe it's your favorite knitting pattern, try CC BY, that's the Creative Commons Attribution License. And if it's data, try CC0, the do anything you like license. I think that's everything. Ah, I'm not gonna go through this, but we have a bunch of nice links on the final slide. I'll add that slide into the etherpad so that you can uh, see that and visit all these links. Thank you. We are going to make you all some beautiful, beautiful open science dreams. Have a nice day, my friends. Thank you so much, Hero. Thank you for stepping in in last minute. Um, we do have a lot of questions, and I'm really glad that you mentioned that we may have uh, Karen joining us for answering all the questions. But I think this is a this is an important thing to discuss. What if I have a combination of research objects, a document, code, and data? Do I need only one license? How do I combine them? Beautiful question. I love your thinking, whoever asked that. Oh, I see it's Alette. Uh, so I would be very explicit about what license I have and where it applies. Um, so, uh, for example, I might do something like, say, my code is under an MIT license, but all of the images are under a Creative Commons license. Uh, and here's my research data. It's under um, a CC BY or a CC0 license. Um, and so long as you make it clear and people can figure it out, we're good. Just make sure that it isn't hard to guess what's going on, because if people have to guess, they will they will get confused and they may do it wrong. <laughs> There are quite a few questions and I have to go back to Etherpad because there are some already in there. What to do when we see licenses like MIT, BSD, Apache, so many names and acronyms is choosing the CC1 enough. Yeah. Um, but then she also said, that was Melly, I think. She also said, oh, you answered that in the slide. That is only for documentation. Great. Then we have question, is there a website where we can find translated version of the license statement? I want to know the answer to that one too. <laughs> Probably so. Yeah, I've shared one CC by repository collection that have translated version, but I have to say, I'm not sure if that really covers everything. Definitely a good question for us all to know if there are any. Wonder if other speakers have any, uh, or anyone else in the room knows if there are translated version of licenses that are available. Okay, 
I think it's for us to go back and check. Great. Another question is if you're make, using a readme root directory for defining license, does it imply it to content license only or all? It usually means the whole thing. Um, you can be as explicit or inexplicit as you like. Um, <laughs> I would recommend being super clear. Put it in the root directory and assume that it applies to every file in there. If there's some reason it doesn't, maybe separate them. Because if you have a cake, it, you can't really expect people to only pick out the chocolate chips. <laughs> okay. Um, can I share one anecdote from one of our previous speakers? We generally had shown that, you know, we, we heard from Mariana about README and we say README is a welcome mat in your house. That's the first thing that someone comes in and sees and feels attracted and valued. But license is you giving them authority to enter and touch the things in your house, right? So there is like, it's it's okay to let them in, but licensing actually gives them a bit more, you know, can I touch this? Can I have a water? Can I actually like giving the permission? Thank you so much, Yo. Um, we should all have a lot of questions about that and we'll make sure that you have chances to speak with you and other speakers. Thank you once again. Same, uh, I'm gonna do an actual applause. Please give your kind of applause, choose what works for you today. Thanks so much. And with that, it brings me to our very, very early riser or very late nighter, Saskia for Code of Contact. Please tell us where you are and what time it is and go ahead with your talk. Hi everyone. Um, so it's it's currently 4 a.m. I'm in Australia and I'm very pleased to join you guys. So I'm just gonna do the whole sharing thing and let my tired brain work this out. All right, hopefully this works now. All right. Very good. Yes. All right. So I'm going to um, chat to you today about designing and enforcing a code of conduct. And I'm going to, in particular, speak a little bit about um, the second part of, um, of, of the title, because I think it, I think we often sort of underestimate um, that bit when we chat about code of conduct. But before we go on, I I um, sort of kind of wanted to remind you of what you're doing here and why a code of conduct might be necessary. So, so from what I'm gathering about your program is that you're all here to want to design and build projects um, that do open source science where you can collaborate with others. And when we talk about other people, what in any project is important, whether it's big or small, is that you want to think about how do you want to communicate with these people and when you think about communication, communication leads typically to community. And communities flourish best when we have a shared culture. That's typically when they work really well. Um, but it's actually really interesting that most people often overestimate sort of the extent of in which we actually share values. And, you know, you might think that we all sort of think the same, but that's actually a real big misconception. So it's important to explicitly state what values you have in your community and what types of behaviors you want to see. And the code of conduct is simply the document that captures that and hence guides sort of the behaviors within the community, ensuring that everyone is safe and is respected. So that's um, all the reasons why you should be thinking of having a code of conduct. So in the next little bit of the talk, I want to sort of contextualize a code of conduct by my work at the Bioconductor Project. So the Bioconductor Project is an open source project. Um, it's a repository of over 2000 R packages that are related to the analysis of current and emerging biological essays. We have about 50,000 users worldwide. Um, that's just a really rough estimate because it's actually kind of hard to get. But these come from all over the globe. Um, and to sort of guide um, our interactions within the community, which ranges from sort of forums to Slacks to GitHub, um, as well as, um, you know, um, a developer email list, um, 
we decided to establish a code of conduct committee that was dealing specifically with the code of conduct in 2020, and I've shared it ever since then. So this is the lovely code of conduct committee that the bioconductor community has. Um, it has since 2020 ranged from between 10 to 12 people um, who are deliberately drawn from all over the world. And we try to be really inclusive here. And they have different nationalities, live in different countries um, and have different experiences. And that's really important to reflect the community that we are serving. Um, we also rotate our members out. So roughly every year we um, actually hold um, elections for code, new code of conduct committee, rotating about two to four members out. All right. So in 2020, when we started the Code of Conduct Committee, we also redesigned the Code of Conduct that existed at that time. And um, the one thing sort of that came to fruition at that point was that, you know, a Code of Conduct is actually quite a simple document in its purpose. And our purpose is simply to protect members and the community from harm. Um, and so I just wanted to sort of share this again and make it very, very clear in everyone's mind that that's what a code of conduct is supposed to do. So with that in mind, a code of conduct actually, by necessity, is it is it needs to be very, very simple and only include the absolute essentials. Everything else that you will put in the code of conduct will actually weaken it and result in more violations of your code of conduct. So in particular, that means that a code of conduct you want to list only the unacceptable behaviors, which is kind of counterintuitive, rather than, you know, being very descriptive about the good behaviors that you want. Um, so that's just one of the um, things that I want to leave you with in terms of designing a code of conduct. There are excellent code of conducts all over the internet, and I have listed some here that you might want to draw on for, for your project, as well as a wonderful book that is listed at the bottom um, that is an actual open source book that you should definitely have a read about on because it doesn't just touch on the code of conduct, it also touches on enforcement of the code of conduct, which we'll go into next. Um, so as I said, I'm not gonna talk a, much longer about the code of conduct because I think there are excellent examples out there, including the, OL, um, the OLS um, project itself. Um, so, oops, I went one, two, Somehow, there we go. So part of a code of conduct is also that you need to have um, a way to report violations of or possible violations of the code of conduct for your community. So this is um, something we also um, started designing in 2020 and optimizing. So we found that Google Forms work really well for this. So um, these allow for anonymous reporting, non-anonymous reporting, and we also list all of our emails there in order to allow people to actually reach out to us in person if they want to do so, because these, these incidents can be really stressful for people, obviously, and so you want to give them as many, many opportunities and options in how they can reach out to you. Um, the final thing was that when we designed the code of conduct was that it's very important to educate your community about the fact that you have a code of conduct, because you want people to learn about it, the rules, the norms that you have before you give them a chance to actually be able to violate them. So for us, this has meant that we have been we've been asked to present on the code of conduct and in person events that bioconductor holds. We have. Um, when you sign up to any of our forums, you typically have to agree to the code of conduct, which is very useful. You can, we have them on our GitHubs and um, in any way possible, we try to remind our members continuously about the existence of the code of conduct. All right, but a code of conduct, talking about sort of violations, a code of conduct is actually only effective if you're prepared to enforce it and if you're prepared to um, deal with violations in um, a meaningful way. Um, so you're not the police or the judiciary as the code of conduct committee. So the first thing that you want to sort of think about when you come to enforcement is that you can only enforce the code of conduct upon the spaces that you as the code of conduct committee actually have sort of sovereignty over. 
um, that you can actually sort of, you know, regulate. So um, we, as the Code of Conduct Committee from the Bioconductor um, Project, we had to really think long and hard what our communities were. So we came to the conclusion that, you know, our remit was really Slack, GitHub, um, as well as in-person um, venues, obviously, um, and then maybe to a lesser extent, social media. That that is actually quite difficult for us to um, to sort of regulate. But it's it's very important to understand the spaces that your community actually exists in and works in, and how you might be able to regulate this. So once you have sort of decided on the spaces that your code of conduct um, committee is able to sort of regulate, then you want to deal, want to next think about how do I actually deal with um, issues or when reports of violations of the code of conduct come in and they will come in. That is also another thing that we have learned. Um, and as the bioconductor community, um, we have now sort of got a five-step process of what happens when we get one of these um, violations. So the first thing that we do is um, we acknowledge the report and make ensure the safety of the person that reports the violation. Um, at that point, we then um, start our initial assessment of the described incident, trying to sort of gather evidence. And I'm put, going to put evidence in quotation marks. It's mostly sort of a fact-finding exercise of, especially when things happen online, you go back to the slacks and see sort of what, who has said what, if you can, um, uh, but you always want to do this with the anonymity, the anonymity of all parties involved. Um, at that point, we also um, follow up with the um, alleged violator. So we call them the reportee um, of the incident. And um, we give them we contact them and give them an opportunity to share their side of the story. That's also very important. Um, we try to do all of this. So the, the initial report acknowledgement, we try to do it in 24 hours. The rest of it, we try to sort of do it in a week. And at that point, we then um, have a code of conduct committee meeting um, that excludes any people that have recused themselves from um, the incident. And we try to determine a resolution. And resolutions here can range from anything, doing nothing, um, issuing a warning, um, try having just a chat. It can also sometimes just be that, to a temporary ban and a permanent ban in our community. And after all of that, there is a chance to have an appeals process for, um, for, the, uh, for the report heat. So um, with sort of picking the resolutions to any of these incidents, um, a code of conduct is only really effective when it's enforced proportionally. So that means that you kind of are always trying to pick a solution that is, or a response that is the minimum that keeps your community safe is how we want to look at it. So it's probably not going to be a permanent ban. It's not very effective if you as a code of conduct committee is choosing to do permanent bans all the time. And it's probably not going to be a warning either. It's probably somewhere in between. Often it seems to be very helpful to um, have a chat with people and agree on sort of th that there was a violation. That's very important that, you know, this that the person has come to that understanding that they did violate the code of conduct and that they agree to refrain from doing so in the future. All right. Um, finally, I just kind of want to leave you with the fact that it's also you as a code of conduct committee have to be really clear that you have power in your community and as such you need to also be held accountable. In the bioconductor community, we have um, an ombuds person that comes from an unconnected project that can be asked by the reportee or the reporter to be part of a code of conduct resolution. And as a code of conduct committee, we also draw them in, in when we find we have a dicey case that we are dealing with. And um, finally, I think it's really important to um, you know, publish what you're doing in the limited manner that you can 
you know, again, you want to be very clear that everyone has the right to anonymity here, unless it, it you know, it harms the community or makes the community unsafe. Um, so we do publish a transparency report um, every year on what cases we have um, had um, and how what resolutions we have um, dealt with. And this is actually quite important for um, funding organizations such as the Cheng Zuckerberg Foundation to have this transparency report. So I'm just going to mention it here. And really, that's all for me. And um, I'm happy to ask answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Afkia. There's lots of discussions on the chat going on. Um, I, I know, Yo, you've been keeping an eye on the chat. Can you can you probably take over that I was creating breakout room and full transparency as well? Hey, uh, so thank you so much for the really good talk. Um, so I'm actually going to raise something that Conrad questioned, which was are things like don't interrupt people when they're talking. Is that something reasonable to put in a code of conduct? Oh, um, I get, I think, I mean, it depends, right? It's, it's sort of <laughs> depends on your willingness to um, deal with those um code of conduct violations that come through as well, I would say. If it's really important to come to your community, first of all, yes, if it's really important to your community, of course, you should put it in. Um, but I think always down the line, you also want to think about, is it actually something that is enforceable? Um, um, if I think of you know a rule that is not enforceable is cannot be a rule in a code of conduct. That's that's my view on it. Um, and so I would be very wary of putting something like this in because it would just, you know, create a, a, a really big workload for a code of conduct committee, I would fear. Let's unmute before we speak or it won't work. Thank you. Um, another one very quickly that we have from Daniel. Should a code of conduct contain the contribution file or is that a separate thing entirely? I think that would be a separate thing entirely to me. Like the code of conduct, as I said, is only the essentials, really limited absolutely to only what you want to what you want your people to know, how they can report a violation what the like list of unacceptable behaviors may be a value statement that can be useful and then just who is on the code of conduct and ensure them that you know code of conduct um, violations are dealt with and that there and which people are in charge of dealing with them thank you so much Malvika there's one more question which actually comes which comes up quite a lot the name code of conduct might sound too strict for some communities. Where are some alternatives? Is community guideline the same? Oh, I think, look, I might have a controversial opinion on this, but I think it's important that it is sounding strict because it is strict, right? Like it is not, it's, it's not guidelines this is what you want people, you want people to act that way. So it's not really a guideline. It is, it, it, it's a rule and it should be treated as such. And I think if you, if you start weakening it there at that point already, then you, you're going to down the line have um, much more conflict and many more violations possibly because people weren't quite clear that this was a rule because it was a guideline and maybe a guideline means for them that you know sometimes you go by it and sometimes you don't so I'd be very very careful of um, of sort of weakening these statements. Thank you so much Saskia. I really appreciate you tackling this very tough topic um, folks. This is our last speaker today. Thank you so much. Um, we you. have next breakout session. However, Saskia has been invited to our Slack channel. You can find her there. And also Saskia will share the slides with contact if hopefully anybody wants to reach out to her. Thanks so much all. Thanks to all the speakers. This is a breakout session. So if you all um, want to take a break, turn off your video or drop absolutely full permission. This one is five minute short breakout session on vision statement. 
we had already started this exercise in the week one. Today, we're going to give you a chance to speak about your vision statement with another person in the room and um, get some advice on it or share your own experience building your own vision statement. All right, so I have created a breakout room and I'll open it and pull you back exactly at five minutes point. Enjoy. I, we have arrived to the really, really end. I hope you had um, the chance to hear each other's vision, which is sort of a beginning for your assignments. Um, we have been talking about GitHub a lot, and I am like being apologetic that not everybody knows what GitHub is, but we have next week a GitHub workshop for those who are new to it. Please come along, we'll work with you to do this exercise actually. The assignment is that you would start building your repository either on GitHub or somewhere else, which is a bit more public. Um, we are providing a GitHub issue, which is on OLS 8 GitHub repository, where you will be creating an issue for your project. You can already see some folks have created their own issue. They have started to comment on each other's issue. That's where you would be sharing your vision statement that you shared with others and have more chance to look at other visions, which are always really, really inspiring which is an opportunity to, for you to also identify who's working in the same field as you, might want to collaborate, might, you might want to contribute to their project. We talked about README, we talked about license, we talked about code of yeah. conduct, and all of these three files are something that you would be beginning to write. This is not expected of you to write next week or in, in a month, but this is something you should start thinking about, planning for it, Talk to us, talk to people who have worked on this before. Think out loud in Slack with us. We love listening and reading what you are doing. We find that extremely inspiring. And thank you for joining us today. Thank you all the speakers. Um, it was lovely having you all around. It's a great end of my day, wherever you are. I hope you have a lovely rest of your day and great week. Awesome. Thank you all.